My name is Steve Kelly. I'm the Vice President for Economic Development for Lawrence Chamber, and I will be your uh, moderator or the MC, I guess, uh, for this evening's presentation. Uh, and first, before we, we move into a, a description of kind of what the format's gonna be, I do want to take just a moment and express for our entire group uh, our empathy and our concerns about the situation that our business community and our community as a whole has been dealing with for uh, these several months. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a situation that in many cases continues today uh, and may for yet a period of time. And so the, the impacts on the community at all levels have been significant. Uh, they've not been borne equally by everyone. There are some areas of our economy and of our community that have not had significant impacts while others have been devastated. And so our hearts uh, reach out to you and we're, we're very concerned about what you've been dealing with. Uh, and hopefully with some of the information provided this evening uh, and some, some other things that may be coming down the road in the future, uh, there may be some opportunities for you to, to get some relief and get some assistance. Um, but again, the, the impacts have been significant. And just kind of as a, a point of reference, uh, you know, Douglas County and really the entire state had been going through a, almost an unprecedented period of, of positive economic news. Unemployment has been very low. We've been about 3% here in the county. Uh, you know, March uh, and, and the pandemic hits our area and hits the, the rest of the country and our unemployment skyrocketed. Uh, it has come down a bit. We're at about 8.3% now, which is certainly better than we were, but we are still above the, the, the statewide average of about 7.5%. And looking at percentage and the impact on, on the, the community in more individual terms, that means approximately 3,300 people that had employment prior to the pandemic now are still remain without uh, an opportunity, a job opportunity. And the impacts on a number of our businesses, particularly those that are uh, the types of, of businesses that, that, do, that are involved with customers on a close proximity basis, those still continue to suffer. There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of pain in, in a large part of our economy. And we recognize that. And again, you have our sympathy and, and, and we're doing everything we can to try to help you in any way possible. The, the program tonight, um, will hopefully provide you some information on this process whereby businesses in the community can apply for some potential opportunities for assistance through the CARES Act funds that the, the county received. And, and Sir will go into much more detail about this. Uh, and this is all part of a process that the, the, the state has aligned. The state received some funding from the federal government and has provided a portion of that to the county, which is what we're talking about tonight. And then there are other streams of funding that are set up to come at a later date, some in the not too distant future, and then potentially some other funding down the road, which also might be a possibility for relief for some of you. So uh, this is not the only game in town, as they say, but it is the, the, the game that we're talking about this evening. So on the program tonight and providing information, uh, Context and background, we have Sarah Plinsky, who's the county administrator, who all of you probably know or are aware of. Uh, we have Diane Stoddard, who will be talking uh, in, in significant detail about the, the application process and how to apply for funds and providing some other information around the process. We have Jasmine Moore, who's the sustainability director for the city of Lawrence and Douglas County. Um, and another team member who will not be with us tonight, Paula Smith. Uh, who is the mentor for the Can and Kansas director for the Kansas Volunteer Commission, which is part of the Kansas Department of Education. We also have Ryan Rains, uh, who's my partner at the, at the Lawrence Chamber and is our business development and programs manager. And he's gonna help me towards the end of the program talk about some of the other potential funding that's coming down the pike. And then we also have Britt Comcano, who is kind of managing the the back end and uh, the real work of the process. She's the one who's gonna be managing the chat room. And again, we encourage you to, if you have questions, to put those in the chat box. And we will not take questions during the, the body of the program, but there will be an opportunity at the end 
and we'll try to respond to all those that we have answers for. And if you have questions that we can't answer on the spot, we will research those and then we'll, we'll post that information. And, and, a, and the place to go for information, uh, a reminder for that is the, the, there's a site where all this information, the webinar, the application, all the supporting information will be placed. And that is, uh, the website is lawrencechamber.com backslash care, C-A-R-E-S. Again, that's lawrencechamber.com backslash C-A-R-E-S. And again, that will be the location where you can find all this information. Uh, answers to questions will be posted. Uh, it's the porthole to access the application and support information for the application. So it's a real important part of this process to, to be familiar with that. And again, this webinar at the conclusion will be posted. Uh, and we did a webinar yesterday at 11 o'clock in the morning. That one is also on the site so you can have access to all that information. With that, I'm going to, uh, oh, and the other thing I want to remind people is please stay muted. Uh, it's, you know, we have a number of people on the line and it gets pretty disconcerting and confusing if we have folks who aren't muted at the, during the, the, the conversation and during the presentation. So please try to remember that. And with that, I will pass the baton on to Sarah Plinsky, the County Administrator, who's gonna give you some context and background on this process. Thanks, Steve. Just a little bit of background on uh, this round of CARES Act funding. So um, we talk about, we're going to talk about the words CARES Act and SPARC and coronavirus relief funds. And so I'll try to explain all the acronyms a little bit as we go. So uh, the state of Kansas received um, significant uh, coronavirus relief funds, so CRF, and they created a SPARC committee to help guide how those funds should be distributed to Kansans. Um, the first thing that SPARC committee did was take um, and look for the first round was said that Johnson County and Sedgwick County received $194 per person directly from the federal government um, because of the size of their communities. And so it said the rest of Kansans should receive that same amount. So they took $194 per person and divided it out amongst, amongst all cities and counties in, or all counties in Kansas. And then they said, let's add another 50 million on top of that to do um, COVID impact funds, which are for counties that have had significant um, either COVID cases or significant un or, uh, unemployment. And so Douglas County received a little bit more funding from that as well. So the total amount that Douglas County has available to it for this first round of coronavirus funds is $24.9 million. Um, they're already planned a round two and a round three. In that round two and round three that I know Ryan and Steve are gonna talk a little bit later, uh, particularly round two, there is over $630 million available for that. So I think it's important to set the tone that um, while uh, $24.9 million is a lot of money, we fully anticipate that we will have 50 million in great, uh, valid, wonderful, needed community projects submitted for those funds. And, uh, and that we really think that folks that maybe don't get included in this first round of funding any work that they have done can be useful and submitted um, and, and helpful in future rounds of uh, CARES Act funding. So um, the timeline for all of this decision making is very, very short. Um, we, we found out about this less than 30 days from when the county is required to submit a plan to the state of Kansas. So uh, we, the county has to submit this plan by August 15th. It has to be reviewed and approved by the Board of County Commissioners. So uh, we are really asking folks to work very, very quickly and submit um, plans and, and projects as soon as possible. And Diane will cover all those timelines here as well. And so it's important to note that there are, and I know Diane will cover this, but there, there are, um, public sector reimbursements that will come off the top of those uh, inside that $24.9 million. And then the amount of aid that we will have available for direct aid will be reduced from that as well. Um, so uh, it's, it's and, and in this process, the county decided to use um, the countywide 
uh, co coronavirus recovery team um, that we had set up as Unified Command stood down. Uh, we set that group up and the recovery coordination team includes the me members of the city, county, LMH Health, Public Health, as well as the Chamber, USD 497, and uh, the University of Kansas. Um, and then from that, we have four branches inside that. So you're here talking about economic uh, impact, which is RSF1. RSF2 is health and medical. Um, and RSF3 is housing and human services. And RSF4 is education. So each of those groups are working on developing their pieces of this direct aid plan. Each of them have slightly different um, um, processes and procedures. So if you have a hat that could be education or health and medical, I encourage you to let us know and we can try to get you in touch with the right people. So the intent here is to have each of those groups work to develop direct aid plans. Um, submit them to the RSFs and then have them reviewed by the countywide uh, coronavirus recovery team. And then from there, that would be submitted to the Board of County Commissioners. Um, did I hit the highlights, Steve? Is there anything you missed that you wanted me to cover? I think that was a pretty good overview, sir. I don't think so. So I'll be on the line here. Okay, yeah, great. Well, I'll be on the line for questions at the end. And Again, I'll just turn it over to Diane. Very good. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, again, I'm Diane Stoddard and happy to be with you this evening. My role this evening is going to be to review with you the technical details about the availability of funds, uh, who is eligible to apply for funds, and then the process for applying for those funds as well as our group's criteria that we will utilize to um, weight those applications when we pass them on for the county commission. So I'm, I'm also going to reiterate um, Steve's comment um, earlier that we feel for all of you as businesses and we're so sorry that all of this is happening. I know all of us will be really happy to um, have all of this situation behind us but hopefully this, um, this webinar will be helpful to you this evening to try and access some of these funds and also some of the funds that uh, will be released later for the state uh, that'll be discussed. So I'm going to share my screen because I think it will be most helpful to you if I walk through um, the website that we've put together and the exact process that you'll be using as an applicant. So in the chat box this evening, um, we placed a couple of things that may be helpful to you, including that website link that Steve mentioned. So lawrencechamber.com backslash CARES is the key website here. When you get to that site, this is what it looks like. And um, as you scroll down, there's some information about the CARES Act funds. Uh, you can see the recording from our webinar from yesterday that we did uh, that you can click on there. But um, in order to find out the eligibility information, frequently asked questions, the steps of the application, the application itself, um, and, and then finally actually to submit an application, you're going to click here. So if you click this button, you come to this website portal that we have on the CARES Act funding. And the first thing that you're going to notice here at the top is that we have a sign up button for email updates. What I would like to encourage all of you to do is right after this webinar um, or even during the webinar here, go to this website and go ahead and sign up for email updates. We've actually already used this today. Uh, so people who'd signed up for it um, yesterday already got an update from us because we had some additional clarification after the last webinar and we also were able to post a round of frequently asked questions today. So we'll be using this as a way to communicate important information to potential applicants for this fund if things change between now and when the deadline for the submissions are. 
So the first part here is, um, is a bit of information that Sarah had recapped. And I think there's some links here that may be helpful to you in this first paragraph. So again, as Sarah explained, these are um, some of the monies related to the Federal CARES Act, what we're calling round one of funding that's coming through the state of Kansas. And if you click on this link, it's the announcement from the county about the, these funds and the process that Sarah outlined with uh, dates and that kind of thing. Um, and also some details about our COVID-19 recovery coordination team. And Sarah mentioned the, um, the various four um, RSF groups that have been assembled under the coordination team framework to assist with various aspects of recovery. And the our recovery coordination team, the economic recovery group or the RSF1 group, uh, has been tasked by the county to seek applications for funds um, related to the business community or other organizations which are not health and medical, housing and human services, or education related. Um, education related uh, um, organizations might fall under RRSF if you might be putting together a program that would help um, um, the sector, the business sector in some way or unemployed people in some way. But otherwise, organizations and businesses that fall under one of these other designations should seek some guidance from the other groups organized under this recovery coordination team. And again, you can find out more details about that and, and the contact information for the other recovery uh, teams under this link. There is a tight time frame, as Sarah mentioned, on all of this. And so the, the time frame for business funding applications um, are going to be due by noon on Thursday, July 30th. So we know this is a really tight time frame. Um, you all are taking a great first step here this evening by getting educated about this process. And, um, and honestly, I do think that if anyone has ever applied for a grant ever, or certainly any grant that deals with government and particularly federal funds, I think that you'll find the application associated with this process to be one of the more simple ones. And it's, it's actually fairly simple and straightforward. So next I'd like to cover funding availability and eligibility. Um, Sarah mentioned that the county's share of these CARES money is 24.9 million. <clears throat> However, there's some prioritization of those funds uh, that she mentioned for uh, reimbursements to the various groups that were related to the unified command of the initial response to COVID the public organizations, including the city and the county, the health department, and also LNH Health. And there's some other county approved community aid programs that will need to come out of these funds um, as well. However, some remaining funding could be eligible for businesses to apply uh, for these funds. The amount isn't known, somewhere between the um, zero and the 24.9 million, but we don't exactly know because the county doesn't know how much to expect in all of these applications. <clears throat> Our um, group will be having the highest priority um, aimed at businesses that have some direct expenses to COVID-19 and also local small businesses under 100 employees in highly impacted sectors. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about why we looked at that. Um, and, and additionally, as Steve mentioned in the beginning, there are some um, SPARC funds that um, is round two of some of these CARES Act monies. And he and Ryan will be touching on some more details about that. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you knew this is dealing with round one funds. Round two funds will be something that we'll find out some more details with in the near future. So first, in order to apply, a business or organization must have a federal EIN number. An EIN number is an employer identification number, also known as a federal tax ID number. <clears throat> um, further, we're encouraging and the county is encouraging 
businesses to work together to submit umbrella applications related to some common expenses within a similar industry sector. So an example might be the Lawrence Restaurant Association organizing an application for restaurants. And a businesses receiving funds or coordinating the receipt of funds uh, will be required to work with the county to submit reports for federal reporting since this, these are federal funds and this will be need to be detailed, including receipts and other documentation of expenditures. And they'll also be required to enter into a funding agreement with Douglas County. The other thing I want to emphasize is that funds need to be incurred within the time frame going back to March 1st, 2020 and going forward to December 30th of 2020. So that's the only time frame of eligible expenses related to these funds. It was very important um, to the state to get the funds out and get them spent, which is the reason for the um, short time frame. <clears throat> I want to go up and um, not forget to cover a little bit about guidance for the eligibility of expenses for applications. So it's linked here on the website and when you click on that, you'll come up with a document <clears throat> that is related to County CARES Act funding. Let me make this a little larger so everybody can see it a little better. And this particular document provides some guidance about um, the CARES Act funds. Again, discussing the, the need for expenditure by the end of the year. And importantly, that the round one funds cannot duplicate or supplant expenses that have been or will be reimbursed under any other federal program. So if your business has already received a PPE, PPP program funds or other federal funds, <clears throat> um, this program, these, this uh, round one CARES Act funding cannot duplicate uh, the, the losses that you applied those funds to. Uh, it can be different expenses, but not the same expenses. So that's something to consider. The county also provided this document regarding uh, reimbursements. Uh, dating back to March the 1st. And um, some examples of those kind of things that relate to businesses might be some of your expenses for personal protective equipment that you may have um, spent, masks and that kind of thing that you might have been using for your employees or gloves, that, that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, and then also, there's a little bit of guidance here that I believe is from the federal guidance talking about a couple of other ideas. Um, um, grants to small business to reimburse costs of business disruption, um, um, training programs for employees, et cetera, might be some examples of some other expenditures. <clears throat> and further, there's some other guidance back on the website, additional details here if you click the tab relating to federal eligibility. So there's a lot of details, obviously, regarding these federal funds, and um, you might just need to do a little checking on um, what you, whether you are proposing something to make sure that it is an eligible expense, um, and uh, and you know carefully check that information when you are putting your information together. Um, as Sarah mentioned, um, all of it has to have a tie to COVID-19. And the clearer that tie is, obviously, the more important that is. So let me scroll down here to how applications will be ranked. So our economic recovery team has been asked by Douglas County to rank applications in high, medium, and low priority for consideration by the Douglas County Commission during their process that, that uh, Sarah mentioned. Additionally, um, our team felt that it was helpful to provide a little bit of the parameters that we're going to apply for each application related to how we will put them in this priority order of low, medium, or high priority. So we 
have used a variety of information to help us with this. Um, one is the knowledge that the hardest hit sectors regarding COVID-19 are accommodations and food service, arts, entertainment and recreation, personal services and retail trade. And that these same sectors are also the ones that are likely to take the longest to recover. And there's a link here to an article by McKinsey and Company um, and a link to the exhibit if you would like to take a look at that and look at further detail that we're citing. <clears throat> also, we know that small businesses under 100 employees are the most hard hit with COVID-19. And again, a link to the article in the citation. Local owned businesses and operated businesses are of particular concern to our team. These are some of the kind of businesses that really make Lawrence and Douglas County uh, very unique and, um, and losing them would be a, a great loss to the community. So we wanted to take that into consideration as well. And then um, finally, the highest priority will be placed on applications that have a direct tie to expenses related to adaptation to COVID-19. So these are examples of um, personal protective equipment expenses, physical modification of work areas, such as if you've had to install plexiglass, other changes like that to your business to be able to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Maybe you have had to purchase or install special equipment, have supplies for monitoring um, symptoms of employees and customers, and maybe you've also had to incur additional expenses for cleaning to reduce the spread of COVID-19, or perhaps had retraining or training or retraining expenses. So these are some examples of some particular expenses that we will place the highest priority on. I know there's a number of businesses that have also uh, experienced losses in terms of revenue losses due to shutdown. Those expenses are important, but our highest priority ranking will be related to these um, expenses. <clears throat> so these four criteria are things that you'll be answering on the application form, and we'll go in ultimately to how we would rank the uh, the applications that will be forwarded to the county. Our group will be forwarding every application to Douglas County, so all of that will be forwarded, um, <clears throat> again, with the, the, um, the prioritization that we've talked about. So we have a handy list here of application steps for you. Um, and congratulations, you have met the first application step here by um, watching one of the funding webinars. We'll be posting this webinar also under this link, uh, but we've already posted the webinar from yesterday and the password that you'll need to access it. And it may be helpful for you to kind of watch the webinar. It's a repeat of the information that you've heard today, but you might wanna skip to the section that were the questions that were asked because some of those questions might be different than some of the questions that have come up this evening. <clears throat> Although I will say we, we're trying to be compiling all the questions that we get during the webinars and placing them on the website that I'll show you here in a minute. The second step, you'll want to verify that you're an eligible business or organization. Again, you must have the federal EIN number and you have to have eligible expenses. Again, take a look at that link on the Douglas County funding guidance and we've Put that link down here under the resources and application materials as well. <clears throat> but you'll want to make sure that, that you have eligible expenses and that those expenses must be incurred between that time frame of March 1 through December 30. Third step, you want to download and fully complete the application, which is in Excel. <clears throat> it's located here under the resources and application materials. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. When you open it, it will open a viewing window. You will need to um, <clears throat> go to the file save as menu and save it. And we would ask you to save that file as the name of your application proposal. 
and you'll want to do that before you upload the final application to us. So let me just pull that application up here and show you what that looks like. <clears throat> Again, it's fairly straightforward. You'll have some information to fill out about the sponsor organization. And again, the sponsor organization is that umbrella organization or whoever is the lead organization on the application, the organization that has an EIN number. You'll need to provide some program details and you'll need to provide a proposed budget. And basically that is all the information that is required. So again, it's fairly self-explanatory and fairly simple to complete. I'm going to go back here to the main website now and uh, tell you that if you click on this document, which is how to complete your application, you will have a very detailed spreadsheet that will open up here with some additional details if you find this helpful. Um, one of the things that I think will be really helpful is when you're putting together your budget, you're asked to categorize your expenses. And you will find down here at the bottom of the spreadsheet, various tabs. One of those tabs is expenditure categories that you can see I'm hovering over here. <clears throat> if you click on expenditure categories, you're gonna come up with a pretty large list here. And I've got to scroll over far to the left. And I've got to also scroll up to the top. And you'll see that this sheet has various expenditure categories that will relate to expenditures. So you're going to need to locate the one that most closely relates to the expenditure that you are proposing. Um, a, a lot of that will probably be here in the economic support um, category. There may be some, again, some other expenses that relate to, um, to your employees that you have incurred or other public um, health expenses. So going back again to our list, <clears throat> you're going to want to fully complete that application again and it's just this one form. Um, <clears throat> you're going to save it as the proposal name before you upload it. Your fourth step is going to be really reading and completing the racial equity impact analysis tool worksheet. And you're going to save that file also with the name of your application proposal. That document is located here under the resources and application materials also. And uh, Jasmine in a few minutes will be covering with you the details of how to complete that and the reasons before behind that, that application tool. <clears throat> You'll wanna then double check that you've completed everything, double check that your files are completed. And then once you have completed all these steps, you're gonna be ready to submit the application materials. And again, with the deadline being noon uh, next Thursday. So I'm gonna scroll down here a little bit further. This is where you'll find the frequently asked questions section of the website. And we've already populated this with a number of questions that either came in during the webinar yesterday or, um, or since. <clears throat> and we'll continue to utilize this to communicate with everyone um, about different uh, questions that you might have. So I'd encourage you, if you come up with a question, you very well may have, you may have encountered a, um, someone you may have come up with the same question before and asked it. So you might wanna take a look at this list. We'd encourage you that um, after today's webinar, inevitably you will come up with some questions and uh, you'll want to ask a question um, of us. We're asking you to funnel all of those questions through the website. We're really paying close attention to those and you would use this button to submit a question to us. It does have an email contact for you automatically included. And that's important so that we can try and get back with you as soon as possible. We know that many of you will probably be um, submitting questions to us or maybe looking at these materials over the weekend. 
So we will do our very best to be monitoring for this also um, during the weekend and get you a response back if you submit a question to us. Now I'll scroll down just a little further here on the website, <clears throat> past the frequently asked questions. And again, once you've completed the application steps that I outlined above there, uh, you will go down to this application form, which is all automated. You will have a name for your proposal. Again, this will be the same name that you have also named the files, the application document and the racial equity worksheet. <clears throat> and then you'll also be asked to um, whether you have an EIN number. And again, hopefully when you see that you put in no there, you will know that you're not an eligible applicant. So the next part that you'll fill out is the contact information section located here. And finally, the proposal information. So you'll see the, you get a list of questions when this pops up. These questions are guiding you through the answers again, related to the criteria that our group will be using to rank these proposals, high, medium, low priority for the Douglas County Commission. So you're going to answer yes or no to these questions, <clears throat> um, whether you're in a business or whether it's on behalf of a business, uh, businesses that are 100 employees or, or less, um, if your proposal is on behalf of a business or business employees, in a sector that's been impacted by COVID-19 um, the most directly. Again, those are listed here. And if you say yes to that question, then um, you will be asked to fill out one or more of the sectors that your business is engaging in. So if you would help us um, allocate that out as well. Also, again, um, yes or no, whether your business or businesses um, are that you might be submitting this on behalf of, are they locally owned and operated? Uh, and does your proposal tie directly related to adaptation of COVID-19, such as these kind of expenses? Here's the area where you're going to upload the application spreadsheet back to us. Again, it gives you a reminder here to be sure to name the file, the name of your proposal prior to uploading it. You're just going to simply click on this, upload the file, the same thing with the, um, with the racial and, and um, uh, equity and impact analysis tool worksheet. One thing that I might just mention that's come up in um, some of the other uh, discussions that we've had is whether or not uh, your, you can submit administration expenses with the grant and the answer um, from the county has been that that um, um, they understand that there may be some administrative expenses especially if it is a an umbrella type of organization that's putting it together um, but that needs to be a reasonable figure and i think the amount of around five percent has been been mentioned so i'm going to ask the, the team and sarah have i missed anything in the details that I've shared so far. Okay, great, very good. Well, I will pass it back to Steve then. Thank you, Diane. Uh, next, we'll we'll have we we'll get some information from Jasmine Moore, who will be uh, instructing you and talking about the the equity form, which Diane has mentioned in her presentation, which is a part of this application, and we'll explain a little bit about it and and how that process will work. Jasmine? Thanks, Steve. Uh, again, I'm Jasmine Moore with the City of Lawrence and Douglas County. I'm going to share my screen so that we can uh, walk through this racial equity impact um, tool together. So uh, again, this is linked directly from the same website that Diane shared with you. And um, the, the history behind this is that the COVID recovery team um, that came together a couple of months ago uh, really committed to integrating racial equity into the recovery strategy even before these funds came together. Um, and so there's, and this is because there's 
that that team acknowledged that the there's potential for crises like this uh, COVID-19 to exacerbate existing racial disparities in our community. And so they uh, were very deliberate about wanting to um, think about ways to integrate conversations around equity into the recovery uh, and response. So um, even before these funds became available, there was a team that came together and um, uh, worked to identify some members of the community and members from um, the organizations already working on recovery to elevate equity in each of those four areas that Sarah described earlier. Um, so this one again is the uh, economic recovery group um, and it's also known as RS1, RSF1. And uh, so once this money became available, uh, the conversation was that uh, this was an opportunity to um, integrate equity into the distribution of these funds in a way that could be really powerful. Uh, and so as a result, uh, there was this tool that was created and adapted from some national models. So this is not something we just came up with on the fly, but this was uh, something that was crafted after some, some other uh, communities. And uh, the purpose of this tool is really to serve as a way to evaluate um, all, all decisions related to COVID recovery and response, not just this one funding um, decision. So uh, as, as we walk through this, just keep that in mind that this is a, a, um, a tool that's being used for a variety of purposes. Uh, and so there, there may be some things that aren't necessarily customized to this process, um, but we just ask that you do the best that you can to, to fill it out. So, um, so as you open it up, um, there are two pages. The first page is basically describing the purpose of the tool and some definitions. So, um, so and instructions here. So, again, uh, we've said this over and over again. We realize there's not a whole lot of time to make decisions, um, but we we feel like it's important to acknowledge and think about and talk about equity as much as we can um, in the short amount of time that we have. So the instructions for this tool are basically um, intended for uh, any decision related to COVID recovery and any decision related to COVID recovery is intended to step, three, step through three questions that are listed on the next page. Um, the hope is that a variety of people can be included in this analysis for, for these decisions, um, especially as it uh, affects different populations differently. Um, and again, uh, this form is required to be submitted with your proposal and request for any funding. It includes definitions for equity, institutional racism, racial equity, racial inequity, and structural racism so that everybody's on the same page about uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about equity. And then I'm scrolling down to the second page. Uh, it, the first thing that it asks you for is your RSF number. Um, and that for anybody on this call, it's probably gonna be number one. Um, that's related to the economic recovery. Um, if you don't remember uh, to do that, that's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll know through the process that you apply, which RSF you're applying through. Uh, your proposal, again, this is the same um, name that you've named your application and you've included in your in the other document. Um, and it also gives space here for you to talk about what are your desired results. This next box is asking who participated in completing this tool um, and the analysis. Um, for, for many uh, uh, folks that are going to be applying through this uh, RSF through the economic recovery, it, it might just be a, 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 the business name. Um, if you are a, a consortium that's coming together, this is an opportunity to describe that. Um, so uh, going off the example that Diane shared earlier, this is the restaurant association that's applying uh, for some funding, then this would be a, an opportunity for them to say um, some of the restaurant owners that participated in this process. Um, the next uh, part is gets into the three questions. The first question is, what does this proposal have an ability to impact? 
Again, just keep in mind, this is a, a universal form that we're using for lots of decisions related to COVID. Um, for, for this, we're really asking, um, how does this, uh, does this have an opportunity to advance racial equity? Uh, does it impact any of these areas, some of which are related to our community health plan? Um, we anticipate that most of the folks on this call will be probably focused on economic development or economic stability, which could um, relate to any workforce development or uh, any anti-poverty strategies. If you have others, go ahead and feel free to check those. There's also an other section here if you don't see something that fits ex exactly what uh, you're intending. The second question is, who will benefit from or be burdened by this decision. Uh, so this is an opportunity for you to expand a little bit about um, this proposal uh, and if there are specific groups that will benefit from them um, or, or be burdened by. Um, this gives you um, lots of questions to prompt your thinking on this, but also notice that it doesn't give you, this is a small box, so we're not asking for a thesis um, or a multi-page description about this. We just want to know a little bit that you've, that you've given some thought to this. And finally, the third question are, is, um, are there strategies to mitigate any unintended consequences of this decision? So, um, so as uh, keep in mind that the, the intended audience for um, this information is ultimately the, the Board of County Commissioners who will be deciding, who will, who will be making funding decisions. So, so uh, use this space to think about, um, are there any unintended consequences of your proposal? And if so, uh, if you can give some thought to how you could um, uh, think differently so that you could correct those. So uh, again, this is a two page document. Um, we're really asking that you just give, give some thought around uh, racial equity as you develop your proposals. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing and turn it back to Steve. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, we're gonna conclude the, the, the presentation portion of the, of the evening with a, a, a bit of an overview on one of the upcoming rounds of, of the CARES Act funding through the SPARC Task Force. And as, as Sarah mentioned and has been, had already been indicated, this is a series of different tranches or buckets of funds, if you will, that the state has at its disposal to, to distribute. And again, the first was the, the, the funding that ultimately resulted in uh, Douglas County receiving a tranche of funding as did the other counties in the state. The next round of funding, or round two of the SPARC process, uh, is upcoming, and it's coming, you know, again, this is all on a pretty fast time frame. Uh, they've been developing proposals and plans, and they're going through the approval process as we speak. Uh, and the latest update we had was yesterday, uh, and I'll give a little more detail about what the funding profile looks like, but the SPARC task force uh, made recommendations out of the task force that will now go to the state finance council for the next leg of approval and that originally had been it had been thought that that might occur yet this week but i'm hearing now it might be the first of next week maybe monday or tuesday before they take it up but the recommendations that came out of the spark task force uh, as a whole were the following and and there may be again there's other funds that haven't been allocated yet but what has kind of been laid out in this second round are this in combination and these were put together these proposals or ask if you will were put together by state agencies in combination uh, where groupings are worked around the common themes and what what currently is on the table or, and was approved this week uh, to go to the next step was a uh, in these amounts for education um, that team uh, had a 74 million dollar request Public Health had an $86 million request. Uh, broadband and connectivity is a high priority, uh, as we've all learned with the pandemic and people being uh, in situations where they're working and they're uh, doing schoolwork remotely. Uh, it's a big issue in a lot of rural areas and a lot of areas in general. So that's an area of focus. That one has $60 million in that bucket for a variety of different purposes. 
And then the economic development and workforce uh, grouping or, or section uh, totals around 78 and a half million, 78.6 million dollars. And they've got it broken down into to three main categories, uh, business support and support for not-for-profits uh, is about 61 million of that. There's a local food system uh, support program that, that equals about 9 million. And then there's workforce training in the amount of 9.5 million that are included in this broader set of proposals. And if you break down the, the workforce, or not the workforce development, that really focus on the, the business support programs, and, and uh, Ryan will go into a little more detail about one of these particular programs, which I think probably would have the most applicability uh, to folks who are on this call, but they've got $61.5 million identified for what they're considering to be business retention and expansion. And that would include $32 million in grants to small business and nonprofits. Uh, and, and of that, I think there's 20 million that's specifically identified for small businesses. Uh, and that's what Ryan will be talking about in just a moment. They've got $7 million in grants that are related to COVID research and development and product development. Again, this would be uh, prim primarily for research and development uh, teams that, and, and companies that are developing products to, to counter the impacts of COVID. And then there's $22 million in grants for companies in the state of Kansas who are developing PPE uh, and producing PPE and other COVID related uh, remedies. Could be test kits, it could be the chemicals that are being used in test kits, those kinds of things. So that bucket's $61.5 million. And again, there's uh, the major component of that is, is going to be on the small business and nonprofit grants. Uh, and I'll have Ryan speak just a little bit about the $20 million piece of this, which would be the, the, the part that probably would be of primary interest to most of the folks on this call. Sure, thanks, Steve. So Steve said uh, 20 million across the state, um, and uh, and this is an idea, a concept. It's not uh, been approved yet, as far as we know, in terms of it being implemented. Um, it's still got some more to more ways to go on that, uh, but seven million of that would be for what's being considered the Casey Metro area, Johnson County, Wyandotte County, Douglas County, and Shawnee County. Um, $15,000 grants, so they figure 466 different grants available uh, with a $7 million designation. Uh, it would be available, I'm here in mid-August, early September. Um, there are a few stipulations with that. Uh, one of the stipulations uh, that they're considering is that if any business has received over $2,500 uh, in higher PPP or EIDL, the EIDL loan money, uh, then they would be disqualified from applying for this or receiving it. Uh, and another stipulation uh, is the number of employees. And the last I heard, they were determining whether or not the cutoff should be 35 full-time employees or 50 full-time employees. Um, so again, that program, as far as we know, has not uh, been fully uh, accepted yet or qualified. Uh, to be uh, engaged and put out, uh, but it's an idea that they were tossing around uh, earlier this week. Yeah, and, and, to, and, to, and to sort of file, follow a little bit on what Ryan's comments were about some of the stipulations, I think there's still some ongoing debate about, the, about how this would work in terms of the limitations on companies that may have already received some support. I think that there's certainly a recognition that companies that may have received PPP, uh, may have, rec have received EIDL, received the higher money, that was supportive and very, very helpful at the time it was received. But we're several months beyond that in the pandemic and still are suffering and probably will be for a while. So I think that that's something that's to be determined, but they are, and to support Ryan's comments, they are very concerned and wanna make sure that this has broad distribution that folks who maybe who missed out on some of the earlier opportunities, uh, for instance, the hire program, which is a, a program I think probably in structure that's very similar to what they're talking about with this uh, $7 million for the, the Kansas City Metro, $20 million statewide. It was a first come first serve program that 
with the funding they had available, could fund 333 or roughly 340 projects. And they had 1,300 applications over the course of a weekend. And so in Douglas County, I know there were around 90 applicants, 30 some that were funded. So there were a significant number of people, of companies, or organizations that were not able to access some of the earlier funds. And so I think that is certainly a part of the consideration for the second round is how can we reach people, how can we reach companies, organizations that weren't able to take advantage or, or access the funds because the demand was so high and there were such limits on funds. So that's still a work in progress. Um, and again, all of this is still a work in progress. It, it appears that if it, if it moves forward in the manner that they're talking about, that the applications for these various pieces that I've talked about, the public health, the education, the connectivity broadband, the, the uh, economic development, workforce development would flow through state agencies that were identified as kind of the management or the administration for those. Uh, so that appears to be at least the way it's being proposed. How it, how it ends up being finalized is still yet to be seen, but that appears to be the approach that they would take. And my, my sense was from some of these conversations and, and the webinars that we've, we've been able to sit in on, that once this is approved by the State Finance Council, they will move very rapidly to finalize the application process, et cetera, again, with the idea that this money needs to be out fairly quickly, uh, because as was, was mentioned before, the, the money has to be spent according to the, the federal guidelines by the end of the calendar year. So that's a pretty, a, a pretty robust schedule to try to meet to get this money distributed. And monies that aren't spent will be recaptured by the, the feds. And so we want to, you know, I think the state's very interested in making maximum use of this. Uh, so this will move very, very quickly uh, once it gets going. And again, we're anticipating probably in the next couple of weeks, the portal or the, the ability to start applying for this will probably be coming up. And then the turnaround time, again, and, and you're not going to want to keep hearing this, but the turnaround time for application will be very short, be very tight. Uh, then they have committed to making very quick decisions and approvals. And then the money will be will be the, the effort, every effort will be made to get this money out as quickly as possible so that, that the maximum value and the maximum benefit can be gained. So it's something to look forward to. There's also uh, a, a round three of Spark that's kind of looming out there. What exactly it will look like is still yet to be determined. Uh, and I think, and, and Sarah could probably comment on this with much more uh, background and knowledge than I do. I think probably some of that will depend on how we do from a COVID standpoint between now and that point. Uh, if, if we continue to have difficulties and, and you know, COVID is still a, a, a dominant player in, in our lives, then the public health and safety and dealing with COVID related impacts will probably be a key aspect of that. If for whatever, if we're able to get past and it seems like we're in a better spot, there may be more for economic and other kinds of, of recovery activities. We just don't know. But we do know that probably here in a very short time frame, certainly less than 30 days, probably within a couple of weeks, there'll be a significant amount of information about this next round of coronavirus uh, relief funds that will be flowing. Uh, and then again, uh, certainly something that can be promised, but there is also, also a lot of conversation about possible additional relief funds or more stimulus funds perhaps somewhere around the first of the year that mostly what we've been doing with this has been to kind of deal with the impacts and it's been more survival mode. I think that there, there's a number of folks that are talking about the need for real stimulus money that could be potentially coming sometime around the first of the year after the first of the year. But that again is, is not certainty. It's just something there's a lot of discussion about. So again, uh, stay tuned and we're going to try and, and make sure a lot of this information is posted and available as it's as we get access to this we'll certainly try to to distribute and make sure people are aware of it uh, as, as these things continue to move and as has been noted before there have been a lot of changes in all these processes and all the information so it's it's very key for you to the extent that you can to try to keep up because it's pretty quickly it's pretty rapidly changing 
and you never know when those changes might occur. But, uh, so again, thank you for, the, for your attendance. Uh, thank you every, everyone who has put anything in the chat box. We're gonna go to that in a minute and, and view any questions. But again, please try to make use and, and use the portal that we've talked about, the, the, the lawrencechamber.com slash or backslash care, C-A-R-E-S, uh, is going to be the repository of all this information. It will be very, very helpful for you uh, in a general sense, and also that's the, the portal where you can make applications. So with that, let's go to Britt, and, who's been manning and, and managing the, the chat room to see what we have for questions. Thanks, Steve. You guys must have done a pretty good job because we only have two questions. So I'm going to read the first one, although uh, you probably covered this already, but I think it'd be worth repeating. In addition to PPE, would retrofits like adding touchless things to bathrooms or expanding outdoor seating be applicable? I think the answer is yes. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I asked that question right before <laughs> I got to that part. Okay, second question. If your business is part of a clear sector without an established umbrella organization, is it better to apply individually or as a, a group under one of your colleague organizations acting as the fiscal admin for the group? Um, you know, better is a uh, subjective word. Um, you know, so I, I'm not sure I can say, uh, I, think, I think groups should do I think where possible, if there is a good fit, to have one group apply on behalf of several, uh, we encourage folks to do that. Um, not only because it simplifies the number of, you know, I think the county is potentially looking to have to deal with hundreds and hundreds of different um, organizations that would be receiving funding. Uh, so that's certainly a fact, but that's not a factor in the decision making. Uh, what I would say is that perhaps something that could be helpful is, you know, depending on what you were specifically asking for, if it's like for PPE reimbursement or something like that, if one agency didn't need all of the funds, perhaps another agency could, could share in that. Whereas if one organization applies and they cannot uh, produce receipts and documentation for the whole need, uh, then those funds would go unused. Does that make sense? But really, it, it, it's it's um, really what works best. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Well, that's all the questions we had in the chat box. So like I said, you guys must have covered everything very thoroughly in the presentation. One thing I thought of um, that I didn't cover that I covered in the other webinar that might be helpful is um, is that as you're putting together your budgets and your uh, um, particularly any projected expenses that you might have to be really careful about how you're estimating that. And so again, going back to our example of a, of a Lawrence Restaurant Association putting together a proposal for restaurants, <clears throat> let's say they put in a proposal and it's for $200,000 and it gets funded, but in the end, the association can only find um, entities that have receipts or expenses uh, that are eligible in the $100,000 range. The problem with that will be the county will have already submitted this as part of their plan. It had been approved for $200,000 and it basically means that the county is now going to have to return the unused $100,000. Is that right, Sarah? So everyone um, just be really mindful of that because we want to try and maximize the entire amount of the 24.9 million for our community, not to overestimate your expenses. We want people to estimate appropriately and cover what you need to have covered, but, um, but beware of overestimating things that you can't then substantiate with Are there any other questions? If not, uh, you know certainly you can you can submit questions uh, as as was in, as the instructions in, indicated earlier on. 
Oh, I, I see something that just popped up. Well, here's one last one. We are estimating expenses through December 30th, and that, that would be correct. It, because December 30th is the cutoff date, the, the end of the calendar year or December 30th is, is, is the deadline. Again, if there, there aren't any other questions, you know, right now, please feel free to submit in. Uh, again, the portal, the website that we've talked about before is the key for a lot of that, for all of that. Uh, also, please take advantage of the opportunity to, to sign up for the, the email updates, because I think that could be very helpful as well. Uh, again, this has been a pretty fast moving process and there are changes that can occur. So uh, being able to get those updates and that information will be very helpful to you in this process. Again, uh, we apologize. And again, for the, the brevity and how, how much speed that this has to be done with, but it's the cards that we've been dealt and we're, we're, we're committed to doing the very best we can to, to make this distribution and provide as much benefit as we can to the citizens of Douglas County. So uh, we appreciate your help in this. And, uh, and again, please, please reach out if you have any questions or any concerns or, or issues that you're trying to deal with as you try to make application. And with that, thank you very much and have a good evening.